In this film, the final one of the series, Dr. Asad Khan and I talk to Dr. Jen Curtin, a specialist in ME-CFS and associated structural disorders. We discuss how diagnosis for Chiari, craniocervical instability or tethered cord is achieved, what investigations are required, and then just how do you go about treatment. Hope you find it helpful. Like in terms of investigations, where do you go? Is it MRI? I mean, where, like, where do you start? Where do you finish? So initially, um, you can start depending on what it is. You can start, so for Chiari malformation, typically this is going to be an MRI of your brain or sometimes a CT of your head. Most of the time it's an MRI. And this can just be a regular old MRI. Oftentimes Chiari is picked up incidentally on imaging that's done for other purposes. Chiari is actually reasonably common, one in a thousand. That's not super common, but it's a little bit more prevalent than other things we're used to thinking about. Some people have talked about an upright MRI of the brain. I don't think this is really necessary for Chiari per se. You might consider it if someone also has possible craniosilvergal instability and they're very hypermobile and it didn't look positive or it was kind of borderline on their lying down or supine MRI. The other thing you can do is there's this, something called a cinematic MRI. It's almost like an MRI movie and it's a CSF flow study. So what it does, it's really cool. It, actually tracks and kind of highlights the flow of this, this liquid in your brain, it can look to see if the fluid is not flowing around where the cerebellum is kind of poking down. And if that's true, then that kind of tells you, yes, the CSF flow is obstructed, particularly by uh, the presence of this Chiari malformation. And that can also be an indication that that person may actually benefit from the surgical operation to um, to essentially give a little more space to that area. For craniocervical instability, the imaging here, you can start with um, a flexion extension x-ray of your neck if, if that's kind of all you can get. I wouldn't say that that always shows everything you need. Um, there's something called a digital motion x-ray where they, they actually do, a, it's like a x-ray movie and they do a lot more motions of your neck. So your neck can move in a lot of different directions, not just forward and back. You can have craniocervical instability or atlantoaxial instability, which is just instability at one level lower. It can be in the rotational direction. It can be this direction, lateral flexion. It can be forward back. And you can also even have vertical instability. So it's hard with your imaging. You almost kind of have to try to piece together the different kinds of imaging to get a good image of where someone might be unstable. The digital motion x-ray does a pretty good job of looking at a lot of those, but again, it's not fully standardized how far you move your head to one direction or, or whatnot. So it gives you an idea. Generally for this, a non-contrast MRI of your C-spine, lying down is good to start. I know some surgeons really only need the lying down. It's optional and some surgeons kind of prefer to have the additional upright MRI. Um, where all the all of your weight is on it, like the weight of your actual head is pushing down on that area. And then you can do flexion and extension in the MRI and look if there's any change in how the brainstem is either being kinked or the vertebrae are sliding a little bit in those different positions to see if maybe there's a positional component to the instability or to the compression that the person's experiencing tethered cords in a totally different section of the body. So this one's typically um, recommended that you do a lumbar spine MRI. So that's an MRI of just like the lower back region. In children, like really young kids, they can do an ultrasound because they're, they're small enough where the ultrasound waves can actually get deep enough to see things. In adults, you can't really see deep enough with ultrasound. Um, now, if that MRI, let's say someone's got a lot of symptoms of tethered cord, it's a very strong clinical picture, but their lumbar spine MRI is normal you can consider having them do what's called a prone MRI. So a lumbar spine MRI where you're prone, the person is actually kind of face down and they put a little pillow sort of under your midsection. So you're kind of, your butt's kind of up in the air and they scan you that way. And it gives a little bit, you should see that the, the cord should be able to kind of move a little bit. And if it's really just not moving, it may mean that it's tethered. There's also a third kind of testing that's um, this is called urodynamics. Um, because about half of patients with tethered cord have um, bowel and bladder function issues, 
Um, this isn't positive in everybody, but it's just another step you can go through where they test the function of like your bladder <clears throat> and they look for any possible kind of neurological components to, are you able to avoid normally? Can you sense when your bladder is full? Um, basically a spinal cord related issue uh, contributing to some dysfunction of your bladder. Um, there's also physical exam type things, but generally speaking, a lot of um, <clears throat> neurologists and physical therapists kind of know at least some of the aspects for this. Another big one, I guess, two subjects which are probably interrelated, prognosis and treatment. Um, how do you treat? What's the prognosis with it and without it? Um, and I'm assuming there's different scales here of treatments, some of which include knives and theatres and others that don't. You generally working with a knowledgeable physical therapist, doing some physical therapy, trying to strengthen up the stabilizer muscles in your neck so that you can compensate for any kind of laxity that's going on. Um, wearing a, a cervical spine collar. Generally speaking, a physical therapist will do an exam on you and recommend whether or not you will need one. And then um, you can either have your, some physical therapists will order them for you. Sometimes you need your doctor to write a prescription for it and others you can just buy online. Um, you do want to have any kind of collar actually fitted properly to you. An ill-fitting collar can make things worse and it may not accomplish what it's designed to do. Um, so the collars, the physical therapy, strengthening up the muscles, that's kind of like one aspect of this. And typically the one that's approached first, then you've got some, and this is more in the investigational realm at this point, but, um, for things like craniocervical instability, as far as I know, there's only two people, I think in the United States doing this right now. Um, but it's using injections into the ligaments that are unstable of PRP, Prolo, um, some are doing stem cells to try and get the ligaments to regenerate a bit and become stronger so that they're not as loose. Um, I've had some patients do this and I've seen a mix of results from it. I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent, but in the patients I've had so far, I haven't seen any complications. However, this is a very high risk area to inject into. So you need someone with a lot of experience and they need to do it under imaging guidance because there's a lot of really dangerous stuff you can hit in there. Um, most people, that's why there's kind of only, I think really two people I'm aware of doing that. I don't know about Europe and UK. Um, there may be people over there who are doing it as well. I'm just aware of the, the US folks. And then there's um, surgical options. And surgical options are different for each of these structural conditions. Um, so for instance, if you have Chiari, there's a couple different ways. Sometimes what they do is they can actually take a little bit of bone out in the back here to just make a little more space. Some people, depending on heard, they can actually, the very, very bottom of the cerebellar tonsils can sometimes be shaved down because they don't actually have a whole lot of neurological function. But that's only for very certain cases. For craniocervical instability, this one, you know, when you've got this going on and it's loose up here, the surgery usually involves a fusion, which is you essentially use hardware to fuse either. There's kind of two techniques that I tend to see. They either bolt something to the very back of the lower part of the skull and then to your C1 and then to your C2. And then depending on how unstable you are at lower levels, they may go down to C3, but not, not typically. And there are rods that connect all of them. So what happens is that just basically fuses those bones together and anchors them to the skull. So that way they're not sliding. They can't slide anymore. That's a big surgery. It's not something that you'd necessarily want to just go for. And not everyone needs it either. Um, there's a lot of the symptoms and things that can be managed by really good PT, wearing a collar periodically. You know, I wouldn't say that I haven't seen necessarily anyone cure themselves with that, which kind of makes sense, right? It's not going to necessarily reverse ligaments that are lax, but you can with like regular PT and things, people can get, you know, some, a lot of their symptoms can go down if they're in the more mild kind of moderate range. If someone's really severe, like very severe, sometimes surgery is the option that you have to go for. Um, and in that case, it is necessary and it can make a big difference, but it is a significant procedure, especially for a fusion. And there are potential complications down the road um, that can occur as a result. For tethered cord, 
this surgery, um, so for this one, if you have progressive deficits, so meaning you're starting to, your symptoms are getting worse, it's continuing. If this doesn't get fixed, sometimes it can lead to permanent damage. Um, and so for this one, if the trajectory is that, oh, this is worsening, typically surgery is the thing to go for for this because sometimes those deficits are not reversible if they start to become stable at a point. Um, and so this one, the surgery is done a lot more and there are many different kinds of techniques to approach it. The complication rate for the surgery is I think something below 1%. Um, so this one is actually a lower risk procedure than the others that I talked about involving kind of like the head and neck. And so generally speaking, if someone has tethered cord where there's neurological symptoms that are trending up, it's surgery would be the way to go for this. I'm guessing that there aren't that many surgeons who do this. For tethered cord, actually, there are quite a few. Um, because this is a condition that's seen in a lot of small children. So actually, um, a lot of people who do this, um, often you'll see pediatric neurosurgeons will do a fair amount of this, but also adults as well, depending. Um, uh, I have seen that actually there are some pediatric neurosurgeons who will do operations on adults. And one of the things there that's kind of helpful, depending, is um, kids are generally more hypermobile than adults are. and so. Surgeons who work on kids tend to have a little bit more experience with just having very hypermobile patients. There's differences in just kind of how the tissue works with you, how the sutures hold, how you position the person during surgery so that they don't, you know, basically joints don't kind of come out. In the adult neurosurgery world, there's a smaller group of folks who are familiar if you've got a lot of joint hypermobility involved. It's a little bit of a different approach that you need a different experience set. And I would say there are less people familiar with, let's say, doing craniocervical instability fusions and uh, curare malformation surgeries in folks with joint hypermobility syndromes. It's a lot easier to find someone to do tethered cord surgeries, but because in, especially in a occult tethered cord, where that phylum terminale that everybody has is just tight, it might be slightly thickened. It may, in this case, this is a really obvious one where there's like a little fatty tumor inside of the phylum that makes that phylum really stiff. Some of these folks can have totally negative imaging. And so you need someone with a high level of clinical suspicion and a lot of experience with this condition to really pick up on it and be able to go forward with it. I mean, what is it that patients can do if they suspect it and they're waiting for a diagnosis or if they've had a diagnosis, but they're waiting for a provider to be able to treat them? So there's some things you can do. And essentially there's, you can try wearing a soft cervical spine collar. These run generally like 20 bucks. I've seen some for 15. You can get them on Amazon. Um, and these are over the counter. They don't require a prescription and it can just kind of help very gently stabilize your neck. And you can just see, do you feel any better at all when your neck is being stabilized? This would be more important, I think, for craniocervical instability. Like this wouldn't really be for tethered cord, but um, this could be just something you could start with to just see, do you feel a bit better when your neck is not moving as much? The other thing you can do, there's this one, uh, this like, it looks like a series of airplane pillows stacked on top of each other and you inflate them. This can actually provide, you can, depending on how much you blow it up, it can either just stabilize your neck so it doesn't really move. It kind of acts like this soft collar over here, or you can pump it up a little bit more to where you kind of feel it lifting up on your neck a little bit. And that is actually something called traction. And traction, if you're going to try this on yourself, you want to make sure that you're not having a lot of severe symptoms. This is something that's like, okay, Try it, start it lying down. So put the little thing behind your neck while you're lying down, inflate it very, very gently, and then only leave it on for maybe like a minute to start and then gently deflate it again while you're lying down and see how you tolerate it. If you notice, the best option is if you can find a physical therapist to do some exams on your neck and do manual traction. So they actually gently pull up on your neck while you're lying down. So this guy is kind of He's pulling her head slightly towards him. What this does is it, it essentially kind of 
pulls up on that area. And what we kind of see is people will feel a significant amount of relief from their symptoms. And if that happens for you, where you're like, whoa, when I'm in traction, I feel dramatically better. Oftentimes it's like a dramatic thing in these patients where they're just like, oh, this is like the best I felt in, you know, a year, five years, 10 years. Um, if that's the case, that's a pretty strong signal that you should go down this workup pathway. There are of course, other kinds of pathology where traction can help. Like if you just have a ton of muscle spasm back there and, you know, it could help. And if you've got your discs or are really compressed, or you've got um, compression of some nerve roots on the sides, or the facet joints are really smooshed together and, and causing inflammation, that can also be helped by traction. But there are two other maneuvers that physical therapists can do to try and differentiate with physical exam, which of those things is going on. But the traction or wearing a collar, um, those are things you can try. But just with traction, you want to be very, very ginger with that. Start with just something basic that's just going to stabilize your neck and then something like this and just be very careful with it um, if you're going to do that at home. Obviously, best is if you can get a, a physical therapist with experience to work with you. If you missed the first two films in the series, we discussed what the conditions were, why they might develop as a consequence of infection and what the symptoms are so you can understand whether you might be at risk. Links are in the description. And if you've missed it, you might find the Long Covid Handbook of Interest. Everything you might possibly want to know about the condition squeezed into one definitive and accessible place. The Amazon link for the ebook, hard copy, and audiobook is in the description. Look after yourselves. Until next time.